You're very welcome to this super quick fire Q&A um, following our video on the main channel about Putin's partial mobilization. And this is going to be quick fire, no editing, straight up into YouTube. So not, I'm not going to include your lovely questions on the screen. We'll do that properly in a longer and softer Q&A that um, we're going to do very, very soon. But let's do a quick fire for now. That's um, really interesting because I thought some fantastic questions came in. Why is Putin so obsessed with capturing Ukraine? I think that there's a kind of trivial thing to say and then a deeper thing to say. So let's say the trivial thing first. Putin, of course, thinks that Ukraine is an existential threat to him and to any kind of political system viable in Russia. And he thinks that this war is a defensive war. Can you believe it? He genuinely thinks this is a defensive war. So here is the trivial thing to say here. Ukraine is obviously not a threat. Ukraine that's independent and democratic is obviously not a threat to a Russia that's itself on a democratic path. That's on the path of becoming something like um, a, a modern democratic republic or even at least being halfway to that. But if Russia is conceived of as being an expansive imperial force, then Ukraine could be an existential threat to Russia. So that just sets us up a bit, but it's just not enough. So let's say this a bit more properly. Putin has got various traumas he's accumulated through his time in office and time before office too. One of them is Kosovo, but another is Libya. And he was mortified by what happened to Gaddafi and mortified that Medvedev was, as he saw it, indulging the West around the no-fly zone there. And that, on top of the fate of Saddam, had a huge psychological effect on Putin. And now imagine this. Imagine that he is experiencing a revolutionary wobble within Russia. And that's virtually inevitable. Yeah. Unless it's going to be not him, but his successor who is experiencing it. But either way, that's going to come. The last thing he wants at that moment is a Ukraine next to Russia's border, a culture with um, considerable um, connections to Russia, some linguistic connections, some cultural connections, even though that's all been sort of um, horrifically deformed by Putin's um, aggression. Um, but the last thing you want is a Ukraine next door that's pluralistic and democratic. Forget about NATO or the EU. Just an independent Ukraine next door when an authoritarian regime in, in Moscow is experiencing a revolutionary wobble is an existential threat. Putin thinks it's an existential threat both practically and symbolically. And he thinks that at that revolutionary moment an independent Ukraine would threaten his power would threaten his biological survival or the power and biological survival of his successor. It would threaten the kind of authoritarian model he is running in Russia and therefore would threaten Russian and Russian civilization because nothing else is possible for Russia in Putin's view. Democracy isn't an available option. It's not even an available option in the West for Putin. It's just a sham, wherever it is. So in Putin's mind, his life is threatened by a democratic Ukraine. The life of his successors is threatened by a democratic Ukraine. And Russian civilization is threatened by the existence of a democratic Ukraine. We've got to reject all of this vehemently, but we've also got to understand that there's quite a lot about this sort of constellation of thoughts and fears that's quite rational. Let's not um, confine our sense of what a rational agent is um, by shoving into it our commitments and our values too much. We've got to empathize with Putin and then reject all of this stuff that he's come up with. But it is extraordinary that, of course, even though what I've said is a simplification, Putin is seeing this as a defensive war. And part of the reason he's so enraged and almost crazed when he does these speeches isn't just because he might be ill, is also because 
he genuinely believes this is a defensive existential struggle and this certainly has impact on the nuclear conversation because the idea that you can take off the table in the context of what we've just said about Putin fighting a defensive war, the idea that you can take off the table Putin at least trying to explore the nuclear option is, it seems to me, frivolous, a very frivolous idea that a lot of intelligent people are entertaining. Is there anything Russia can do to take away Ukraine's autonomy? No. Russia can't take military control over Ukraine now. And even if it could, it couldn't take away um, Ukraine's vehement resistance to all of this. Russia has lost ideological control over Ukraine. Even if uh, the West started supplying Russia with weapons instead of Ukraine, Russia still couldn't get ideological control over Ukraine easily um, for the next century, let's say. Hopefully not then either, but um, for that long, it's a closed question. It doesn't matter what Russia does. Um, the prospect of Moscow having ideological control over Kiev is gone for generations. What's your message to Western citizens who see um, the Putin regime and are trying to figure out how to respond? Um, stay in an uncompromising position. Um, and you know you might be going through a cost of living challenge. Part of that could be to do with the war. And I think one of the important things here, and I want to make a video about it, I'm just thinking how to make it sort of compelling and powerful. One of the important thoughts there is that there's a connection between a security crisis and a cost of living crisis. There is a tendency to think that Putin poses a security threat to Eastern Europe, but not to Western Europe. To Western Europe, he just poses an economic threat. I disagree with this analysis. I think that Putin po poses a security threat to all of Europe. And that's one of the thoughts that can keep us disciplined around saying no to Putin and around saying we're going to back Ukraine all the way within limits of not risking World War Three. Would the nuclear strike ordered by, ordered by Putin be executed or is there a chance he'll be disobeyed? There is a chance, of course, but that's not up to me to analyze. Um, mine is not military expertise, but of course, the less Putin is clear that his command will be obeyed, the less likely he is to give it. And the more precarious his position is, the less likely people are to execute his command. So to what extent, I have no idea. But that there are question marks like that there almost certainly is the case. Thank you, Vlad. What are the chances of a block of flats exploding in Russia or something like that to convince people to enter the war uh, fully? Convince Russians to enter the war um, fully, their mentality. Um, that's possible, of course, but that's not going to make enough of a difference. Um, artifactually contrived terrorist attacks aren't going to get Russians mobilized behind Putin's war. Um, a lot more than that would be required. What's the best case scenario for Putin and his luckiest outcome? The best case scenario is that he's in power 10 years from now and that Viktor Orban style politicians are running Western Europe and North America and are happy to reintegrate the Putin regime as it is into the globalized world. Is mobilization not asking for civilian revolt? No, not yet on any major scale. It would need to go further. The numbers would need to be bigger and then casualties would need to be coming back. So we're going in that direction, but at this level, I would say no, not yet. That bond that Putin has, whereby the deal is, the deal he has with the Russian people, that he can't take possession of, of their bodies, of their lives, isn't yet broken by the mobilization saga at this point. That could change. If Putin gets removed, is there a prospect that the person who replaces him isn't worse? Isn't it the nationalists who are frustrated at the failure who are going to be the successes? At the moment, no. At the moment, we're going to have a lot of um, ultra-nationalist crying, but nobody who looks like Girkin and Strelkov or like Kadyrov is immediately poised to take power. One of the practical, if not the de jure outcomes, might be some kind of collective rule for a while by Putin's Security Council. And there are real nutcases and hawks there, but not one of them would have started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, in my view. So 
while that could change for now Putin dropping down the stairs would be more likely than not at least that's the right way to bet on it to yield a better situation um, and a Moscow that's uh, a less of a sort of global political maniac um, but that could change um, why did Putin delay the speech by a day? I think that one factor involved may genuinely have been how to stylize and frame the nuclear threat. I mean, this is unbelievable that that's the level of political degeneration that the Russian re regime has uh, reduced itself to. But... Um, Oh my word, um, it may well be true that they were sitting there and trying to frame exactly how to say, we're not bluffing, our bomb is the biggest, we're definitely for sure going to use it. I mean, that's extraordinary, but I'm afraid that might be true. That might be one of the things that they were um, strategizing. Any comment on the deep politicization of the Russian population? Well, in a way, so many videos we've done are comments on that. But um, what I would say is that the Russian population had some choice and some freedom in this business of outsourcing politics to the Kremlin, which is what has been happening for a quarter of a century. And the consequence of being complicit with your own depoliticization is what we're seeing now. Um, nothing that bad is happening anywhere in the West, but there are some echoes of it where people are sort of giving up on politics and the costs of giving up on politics are very, very high. And yes, it's put in it a bit brutally, but one of the things we can say about what's happening in Russia now is that the population is paying the price for a partly self-authorized expulsion from the political sphere. We're going to talk at length soon. Meanwhile, lots of love and catch you later.